and at the end of 2011, we adopted a, a, we had an EIR council by city council and approved by Caltrans. Um, one of the things that uh, has been a question that's been received a lot by our outreach team is about the number of community meetings, so we wanted to just provide that information that during that time we had approximately 56 uh, public meetings regarding the proposed project, and that also included business meetings, one-on-one -on -one meetings with businesses, community advisory committee meetings, uh, public hearings, and community information sessions. And during this time, of course, the city of Los Angeles was leading the project and we were working closely with Caltrans and the Federal Highway Administration holding these planning meetings and hearing from the community. And as a, another thing that I wanted to point out to remind everybody is the project will demolish and replace the existing viaduct, which is 3,500 feet long, which is about two-thirds of a mile, and it spans over the Los Angeles River, two railroad corridors, which are on both sides of the river, the adjacent industrial properties and the one on the freeway. We have a map in the next slide that will show that a little more clearly. Uh, we also wanted to just uh, point out to everyone that we will continue to receive community input through briefings like this. And we also have established a design aesthetics advisory committee, which is appointed by both the mayor's office and uh, council member Wiesar's office. And we also have a public arts advisory committee, which we're going to be talking about later during the presentation. So this is an aerial uh, photo that kind of depicts the, the project area, just to make it clear for every and everyone. So north is pointing up. You can see the 101 freeway and the I-5 freeway there on the east side, which is where the, right by the 101 freeway, just west of that is where the bridge starts, and it runs to the west over the industrial properties, crosses over those railroads, the Alley River, more railroads, and then it, it crosses down to the downtown side landing at the tail. So this just gives you a, an idea of, of a, clear, a clear idea of where the viaduct project starts and where it ends. <clears throat> so after the project DIR was approved at the end of 2011 and 2012, we started planning for an international design competition. In April, Mayor Villaraigosa and Council Member Ruiz are announced the start of the design competition. We issued a request for proposals. That culminated in, four, in a design competition between three teams, in which we had four public presentations during the design competition where each team presented their design concepts. HNTV team was selected as a designer in October, and we negotiated a contract which was executed and approved by City Council in March, and they began work earlier this year. Uh, a recent action is one, one of the things we're doing in this project is we're hiring the construction contractor now to assist us during the design phase. This is a new uh, project delivery method that we are trying out for the first time in of engineering and we see that it has many benefits to the project. Normally in a project, uh, we design the project, we put the plans out to bid, we receive bids and we award a contract and start construction. So in that model, the contract doesn't get involved and doesn't see the plans until they go out to bid so the designs are already complete. If there's any constructability issues or problems that the contractor uh, would encounter during construction, he has no opportunity during the design phase to provide that input or feedback. Under the model we're using on this project, this construction manager general contractor model, we're hiring the contractor now, they're participating through the design process, giving us their feedback and input so that we could have a, a, a higher quality design and avoid uh, construction cost overruns over the place. And one of the other things that we've been, we've been receiving questions about through the outreach team is about the funding. I just wanted to clarify that funding for this project is primarily from the Federal Highway Administration from the Highway Bridge Program with matching funds from the State Proposition 1B Seismic Safety Retrofit Program and some other local funding sources. But this project is 100% funded, it is fully funded. So with that, I'm going to turn this portion over to talk about the Sunford Internship Program to HNTV, Vic Martinez and Abigail are going to come up here and explain a little bit about the internship program and walk you through the design updates. Now we'll be questions at the end of the presentation. My name is Abigail Sanchez and I work with HNTV. Uh, this summer we have the pleasure of hosting two stories, two students, Damian uh, Tamayo, Christian Tamayo and Damian Rodriguez from Salesian High School. The two students participated in a six-week long summer internship program that was very regimented with curriculum. We didn't want to just give them a paycheck uh, and have them in our office. We wanted them to have an experience to prepare them for their college years, which they are now both freshmen, one in Berkeley, the other at Alpha Mona. 
They were able to interact not just with the professionals and going to executive meetings for this project, but also had business with one and had time with our president, our leadership, and asking them about their career. Um, they also had an opportunity to participate in a press conference with Mayor Garcetti, uh, and he released his mayor hotline. And the culmination of the summer internship program, we had a luncheon in the student's honor, where we had their student, uh, their, their, I'm sorry, their school administrators, as well as the council office, you can see Tanner there from CD14, come and recognize the students, and of course Ms. Wiesar, come recognize the students for their six-week commitment and effort. We will be offering internships for the following summer, and we will make that known per your request. Per your request, um, we were asked why we only included Salesian High School when it was our pilot. We will have outreach to all the schools, all the high schools in the area, Kip, Roosevelt, um, Salesian, um, as well as Belmont. Okay, thanks, Abby. Um, my name is uh, Vic Martinez. Uh, I'm the project manager for the HGTV team. And, and what I'd like to start off here is that um, over the past several months, as uh, Alfred indicated, we were uh, selected started work in March of uh, this, uh, this year. And through that time, uh, we've been working with uh, Michael Molson, the architect who's on our team, and the new architect uh, uh, leading the project for us. Uh, our structural engineers are working uh, very closely uh, to further develop the, the, and, the, and refine the viaduct structure. And what I'd like to do here in the next few minutes is share with you uh, uh, kind of our progress so far. And to start off with, what I did here is I took a one of our images that we have from our design competition and and, uh, and show that and so starting here at the east end of the project which is uh, uh, really shows the signature uh, portion of uh, uh, right at the Little Heights in the community area over the 101 freeway and as we proceed in the uh, uh, westerly direction uh, we have a series of five arches that to traverse through the, uh, the flats area uh, down below and then they uh, hit up to the railroad corridors that Alfred was talking about. And, and then we have another three sets of signature arches over the, uh, the railroad, the Los Angeles River, and the other railroad corridor, culminating one last arch that then uh, takes us from the last railroad corridor to Santa Fe Avenue. So uh, looking at, uh, as we show some of our progress, uh, uh, drawings based on the design work that we've been doing. Uh, this uh, this is a view again looking from the same direction from Bull Heights Community uh, West. As you can see, uh, we're retaining the same um, uh, movement of arches, sweeping arches that we have from uh, uh, east to west. Same number of arches, ten in total. Uh, the only uh, modification thus far is that as we were going through the structural analysis. Of and the design of the project that we modified the piers to be more of a Y shape, but still retaining a lot of the uh, same architectural features that, that we had in our design competition. Uh, looking at the uh, next image, uh, this is at the LA River. Um, we're looking in a northerly direction. Uh, again, those are the three arches, signature arches that I was referring to um, in, in the, uh, the, the first set, uh, the first slide. Um, as you can see, we're also uh, maintaining the walkway that we have proposed uh, connecting both the uh, west side and the east side. I'd also like to highlight uh, what we're calling our, our, our gateway structure, which is a, essentially replacing the existing tunnel that's there now and provide a tunnel that connects the Los Angeles River to the area uh, west of the railroad tracks, providing a pedestrian, bicycle, and also allowing maintenance vehicles to access the river uh, to be able to maintain it as, uh, as necessary. Uh, now I'd like to show some other images that were different locations that uh, show a little closer up view of the of our design, including the arches. In this particular shot here, image we're looking at, uh, uh, we're in the, uh, the west side of the railroad tracks, and we're looking uh, in an easterly direction. Uh, there's the gateway or the tunnel that I was referring to that connects uh, the plaza area here on the west to the river uh, at the other side of the railroad tracks. Uh, this particular image, uh, we're now uh, on the east side of the railroad tracks, between the railroad tracks and the 101 freeway. And uh, what this is showing here again, looking at, uh, at kind of an urban uh, ground view, 
in the flats area looking at a westerly, uh, southwesterly direction. And at the end, you can kind of get a feel for the, for the columns that are touching the ground. Uh, you can see uh, some of the, the, the stairs that were still proposed and they go on the top of the arch. That was an original design competition as well. Uh, this is a um, same location, Joe, but looking in a little different direction, looking in more in a uh, northwest uh, type of direction. Uh, you, can kind of, you can see in this particular image as well the, the stairs that they cover the ground of the, of the area. But, uh, it's in the flats area. It's going to be uh, uh, landscape, uh, hardscape type area that we're going to be currently developing. We'll come back to the community as, the, as that concept gets further developed and present that to you all. And uh, uh, this last image um, kind of uh, kind of pulls back with more of an elevation view, kind of gives you a little bigger snapshot of, uh, of what the, uh, the viaduct would look like. Again, this is on the east side of the river. You can see, again, uh, a little better picture of the, of the uh, stairs that we're proposing coming from the ground to the bridge deck and then being able to access the top of the other. So that's what's still in our uh, concept of further development. Now I'd like to ask uh, Terrence who's going to come up and share some of our initial plans. Good evening, everybody. My name is Terence Powell, Mission TV, and the Deputy Design Manager for the project team. I'll give you a brief overview of two elements. One is the lighting design for the viaduct, and the other one is the intersection updates. First of all, the lighting design, we've been looking at concepts of aesthetic lighting, of how to beautify the, the, the structure. Showing you a, a quick video here. The intent is to use a series of LED lights to illuminate the arches. Regular white lights, but the color temperature can be varied to deliver the effect of a warm, warmer, yellowish light color to a cooler, more whiter uh, range of, of white. And the frequency and sequence, the, the pattern can be manipulated to provide different uh, effects. So that's you see here on the screen the varying uh, sequence. That's what we have in mind. And next, I want to give you an update on the intersections. Um, this is a map showing the overview of the intersections surrounding the six feet by that where we'll be making modifications and improvements to accommodate primarily for the purpose of a detour track. So in the middle of the screen here is the 6 feet by. So to the right, the boundary is the 113 way, the 5 three way, and to the left is uh, Alameda and Central. Um, <clears throat> there, are, there are 20 intersections to be modified and improved, with 11 of them west of the east of the river, I'm sorry, and 9 of them west of the other river. We have started design back in uh, March and April, and we are uh, working closely with the city, uh, working toward a 90% design uh, completion target to be submitted in January of next year, with construction is anticipated to begin in summer of 14 uh, and finishing in, in a few months' time frame. Next, I'm going to introduce uh, Lawrence Tamal. He's the construction manager of the construction team. Uh, managing the demolition and construction for the new viaduct. Uh, I work for Skanska, USA Civil. Uh, we have partnered with Stacy Whitbeck, another general contractor. We form a 70 30 partnership. Skanska is the lead, and we're calling ourselves Skanska Stacy Whitbeck at Joint Venture. A uh, little bit about, about the Skanska company. Uh, we were actually uh, began work in Southern California in 1919. We were known, our legacy company was E.L. Yeager Construction. Some of you may remember that. We were purchased by Skanska back in, in 02, and we've been known as, uh, we're now currently known as Skanska USA Civil West California District. Uh, a couple of projects that you might be familiar with that we've worked on uh, recently and are working on, the Expo 2 light rail line is a project uh, we are uh, currently constructing. Uh, we plan, uh, that project plans to open a little less than two years, so pretty soon you'll be able to take uh, you know light rail from downtown all the way to Santa Monica. It's pretty cool. Uh, Goal Line Bridge is a project I worked on. Uh, our, our 
Kagan. We'll show you a slide of that. We just completed that structure uh, last year, early uh, last year, excuse me, late last year. And, and finally, uh, another project that was very uh, beneficial to the community was, of course, goes back a little time now. It's uh, back in the Northridge earthquake aftermath. And we rebuilt uh, Interstate 5 over Gavin Canyon out uh, past uh, Magic Mountain. Uh, our partner, Stacy McBeck, is uh, a newer company in California. They've been around since 1981. And the reason we picked them as our partners is because they have this tremendous experience with CMGC, whereas we at Skanska have not really been involved with that kind of project delivery method. They've got a number of very successful CMGC projects all throughout the Western United States, uh, mostly in transit. Uh, this is the uh, image. Actually, this is an actual photograph of the iconic freeway structure out there in Arcadia, underneath uh, that crosses over the 210 freeway. Uh, right from your uh, Santa Anita Avenue. So, talk about some of the activities uh, once we get started. Uh, next year, there are approximately 15 buildings uh, in the area that need to be demolished to make way for the new construction. And we'll begin that work sometime uh, next summer. Okay. Another. All right. Okay. So, that work is expected to begin next summer. Uh, at the same time, there are a number of, of electrical utilities that have to be relocated underground because they conflict with the new alignment also. And that work uh, we expect to begin next summer also. Uh, now the major work really begins later in the year, and uh, Terrence alluded to the intersection improvement project, uh, portions of the work. Uh, remember, all this work is being done because once the, the viaduct is shut down, the existing viaduct is shut down, won't be any uh, vehicles or pedestrians able to cross. So we're improving uh, all of these intersections so that they can accommodate the increased traffic uh, that will naturally be experienced. 11 on this side in Wildlife's area, and then of course nine uh, on the uh, west end. A lot of this work could, be, could take place at night and on the weekends. Primarily uh, the work that requires uh, taking lanes, for example, uh, new bus paths, is, is typically something we would do at night or on the weekends so that we're not disrupting normal bus service. Uh, now the viaduct demolition uh, should, would probably not begin any later, excuse me, any earlier than November or December of next year. Uh, obviously, major impacts to the community will closing down a major thoroughfare. So uh, that uh, uh, takes place then. Uh, we'll require some night work, uh, specifically over the 101 freeway. All that work will have to be done at night because of safety and of traffic concerns for a state highway. Uh, the work over the railroad tracks, much of that would take place at, at nighttime also, uh, so that we lessen the impacts to the railroads. Uh, this particular uh, session of work will take six to nine months to complete. Uh, in the slide you saw that, uh, that Victor showed, there was that river gateway. That's this new uh, uh, tunnel, if you will, that uh, connects the, um, the arts plaza to the river. And uh, pretty complicated. This is, in my opinion, one of the more complicated aspects of the, of the work. Uh, crosses the nine active railroad lines in the area. Uh, there will be some pile driving uh, in our current uh, plans to build this thing. So it will, will We'll do that work during the daytime. Uh, it probably won't impact uh, this area much, uh, but uh, again, it's something that would take place mostly during uh, daytime hours. That work uh, would expect it to bring uh, begin in uh, spring of 2015. And then, of course, we have a new viaduct. Uh, if we're lucky and we really work hard, we'll get the foundation started in spring of 2015. And uh, again, some work will have to be done at night simply because the cross freeway or railroad tracks or other uh, conveniences uh, to lessen impacts to the, to the community. Uh, and then I guess we're in the, in the next, in the following meetings we'll talk about some of the other uh, aspects of the project, uh, principally landscaping and lighting, which we can, uh, once we better define, refine our plans, we can talk a little bit more about that next time. And I think Felicia, so. Hello, I'm Felicia Filer, and I'm with the Department of Cultural Affairs and the Director of Public Art, and I have just a brief presentation on 
the uh, percent for art component for this project. Um, just to give you some background, um, when we uh, met with uh, the council office in October 2012, they put forth a motion that indicated that they would like to have a public art advisory committee on this project to help us articulate a vision for the public art component for the program. We submitted a report uh, to council to um, describe what that approach would be, and that, that approach was approved in roughly March of 2013. Uh, over the next couple of months, we submitted some names to the council office, and, and, and he gave some names to us to identify who the five members of, of the uh, public art advisory committee should be. The council office was very specific in that he wanted it to be stakeholders and, and from CD14, and it was very CD14 um, heavy. And so um, we identified uh, five members, and many of them are here today, and I'd like you to stand up and sort of acknowledge. Um, we have uh, Anne Bray from LA Free Waves, uh, Eddie, <laughs> Eddie Padilla, and Amy Flores, and Timothy Keating, and Tim Seward, um, and Melissa Richardson Banks, I don't think it's here, I think we've another meeting. Um, but this, um, it's been a pleasure working with this group, it's been very easy, we've, it's, we've had a very robust and healthy um, and smart and sophisticated discussion, and out of that discussion came what we think is, what we think we've arrived at is a very um, sort of um, forward-thinking vision statement for the public art program. So the, the committee's met twice. Um, the first meeting, they had an orientation just to get familiar with the project and the project constraints, project opportunities, and, um, and to ask any questions that they had about sort of their thinking about the art component moving forward. Um, and then we had a working meeting um, in September 2013 in Royal Heights and really sort of wrestled with the issues to carve out a vision statement and sort of a statement that says how do we want to approach the public art moving forward. And we'll share that with you. Um, the most obvious constraints that, that we start with in public art is looking to the architectural design to sort of give us a sense of what the architect's vision is for the bridge in general and to develop um, a, a, a response to that using the public art. So we looked at the architectural vision um, and there was clearly a decision to do something iconic on this bridge, to make the artwork iconic, to sort of respond to this very large, iconic and impressive design of the bridge. Um, we also heard from some um, community meetings that we've attended to in the past that there's a very strong, we know that there's a very strong and rich history of muralism in the community and how to, to address that component of art making in this, on this project. Um, what are the opportunities, opportunities for local artists? And also a curatorial approach. And we, we, when we say a curatorial approach, there's so many different areas on the project in which public art or art can happen, as well as future art programming. But we wanted to look at the entire project holistically and cohesively, so that wherever there are opportunities are, that, that things sort of tie together and it feels um, like it's planned and not an afterthought. So those are the constraints and, and um, the variables that the, the PAC committee wrestled with as they um, did their work. Ah, okay, so um, the, the portion of the art program that is funded uh, by the, the, the Viaduct Replacement Project um, needs to be an integrated public art work. It has to be because of the funding source. So that was a constraint that um, the committee has to address, you know, um, immediately. Um, the decision of where that public art project or element will take place has not been decided or determined, but we know that it has to be integrated into the bridge. Um, in terms of the other opportunities, we talked about murals um, and whether or not the opportunities for murals um, would exist on, on this, for this project. Um, the architect uh, has, himself had identified muralism and, and, and sort of looked at um, uh, the, the issues of um, cinema and moving image video or moving, moving video images. And so how could that, um, how could the PACs thinking about muralism relative to the architect's vision sort of come together? Um, we think we can come up with another solution to help address the, some of the needs of the murals community through another program. And also, there's clearly a, a need to have some future programming in a lot of the open public spaces that uh, are being developed as part of the bridge. So how can we 
um, also assist with developing um, some, you know, what the future programming, our programming needs are going to be for this project as well. So again, those are all of the um, sort of variables that the PAC looked at, and um, the vision statement is going to reflect all of that. Um, the, uh, the art budget for the uh, Viaduct project is $1.3 million, um, and it sounds like a lot of money, but to do something really grand and integrated, um, we're going to need all of it. And again, so the committee did not decide, um, you know, where where the, the work should take place or how to how to parse out the budget. But I think there was consensus, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but there was consensus to keep the budget intact and to do something really major. Um, so again, these are some of the architectural cues that we, we um, sort of are responding to in, in the development of the vision statement. And uh, I mentioned, the architect mentioned cinema, something cinematic, and the moving image. So we looked at a number of projects that utilize um, light and um, video art uh, in there um, as, as a solution. And some of these projects are permanent installations and some are temporary. Um, we wanted to see what the budgets were, and um, as well as where they were located, whether they'd be on a park or a bridge, because we have both of those components. Um, in this project. So in Millennium Park, it's a permanent video installation. It, they worked in collaboration with the, um, ch 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 the art school in Chicago. Um, you can see the budget is 13.5 million. We don't have 13.5 million, but if we had 13.5, we could do something at this scale. Um, the Bay Lights is a temporary installation. It's on the Bay Bridge. Temporary installation, $8 million. Um, this is another temporary installation by Doug Aiken at the, at the Hirshhorn Museum. Um, really, um, you know, sort of iconic and it wraps around the entire building. It moves. Um, it's very impressionable. The budget is $500,000. And then lastly, there's a, in, in, uh, a piece by Janet Eckelman in a park in, uh, in Phoenix. It's a permanent installation. The budget's $2.5 so we wanted, you know, we again, the pack is saying, okay, we have 1.3 million, how are we going to do something that is equally as iconic and impactful? And that's our challenge, but we're up for it. So the vision statement looks like this, and I'll let you read it. Can the screen be raised up? You can't see it? You want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Um, to create an engaging artwork that is interactive, open-ended, and reflective in Los Angeles with an emphasis on bridging communities and activities flowing around and through the site. The public artwork should address equitable, equitable on-site opportunities for participatory cultural expression and provide the viaduct as a central place for creative activity, enhance the viaduct as a destination and a focal point for the city and consider naming the viaduct as a way to emphasize the potential use of public art as a process for cultural exchange. So um, when we get to the Q&A, if there's any aspects of, of these um, sort of components, we're, we're here to sort of um, give you some additional um, information about the, our thinking and um, yeah, I think that's it.
bridge replacement project, the bi uh, seismic improvement project. So the funding is for the viaduct with a limited amount of funding for landscaping. And as Vic had mentioned earlier, we're, we're developing those plans and in the future meeting we'll be able to present what our ideas are for those areas that are in the bio. Wonderful last question. Um, during Felicia Flyer's uh, uh, presentation, um, the last uh, uh, bullet point mentioned that the potential for naming rights for the bridge. Is it possible that uh, the naming rights could go to a corporation, say like, you know, how Staples Center has that, and then therefore that funding can actually go towards uh, more art installations for the same project? Actually, um, we don't have the capacity or the authority to name a bridge, only city council does. Um, the, the idea came from um, our, one of our PAC members, Anne Gray. And do you want to speak to that about the Peace Bridge? Yeah. <laughs> In our discussions, we came up with there were really two sides to the bridge, and there were uh, two communities, and uh, could we really use the the bridge for a metaphoric purpose, this way it takes the cars across, could we also take people, ideas, culture back and forth across the bridge? And one way we thought was uh, by naming it that, that I had just uh, uh, been to Derry, Ireland, where they have a peace bridge after hundreds of years of war. And I just thought it was very impactful to really put out a specific image to everyone that names that place. And that uh, sort of opened up the idea of what if we came up with a name that also really uh, addressed you know, the our situation. Good evening, my name is Thomas Rafa. I'm a tenure resident at Factory Place uh, Arts Complex over on the 6th in Alameda. And my question is a bit more about demolition. Uh, my main concern is the 6th Street is right out of that window. Where is all this demolition material going to go? I don't even have to be at that point in the process, but this is my main concern is quality of life during this process. Uh, I see these large dump trucks. Uh, how are we going to take all those tons of concrete and steel away? What's the path that it's hard to follow? And, and my other key words of mitigation. Thank you. Yep, right now we're very preliminary stages as far as planning and demolition. We're looking at a lot of alternatives, but principally, all the material that's coming down will either be hauled off immediately or it will be temporarily stockpiled on the site. Not on your side, but it'll be stockpiled in an area in the flats. It'll be processed into, uh, into aggregate base, we, we, we think, and, and perhaps used on other projects throughout Southern California. It's really a market decision. If the, if the material cannot be sold for a price that makes it worthwhile to crush, then we may just go ahead and haul it off immediately. But there won't be any real, other than the, 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 the trucks that will haul material out of out of the area on the west side to the east side or to another off-site location. Uh, there won't be any stockpiling per se of material uh, on the west side of the project. Okay, so, so I'm not going to be having trucks outside my back we're going to haul in hundreds of truck loads. My, my concern is just about the, the noise and truck volume and dust. What we're going to do is, is our best to our ability to limit to the community with, with, uh, with, with uh, truck hauls. And remember, it's not just the material that's taken away from the site. We have 50,000 new cubic yards of concrete to be placed. That's a lot of concrete trucks. Right, exactly. I mean, because I'm at a point of living down. Can you get our own just a little bit? Yeah, it's over there. Okay, thank you. Because um, it is a quality of life, and the reason I'm here tonight is I'm sort of wondering is do I want to stay living inside this traffic box in 4th and 7th and Alameda and Soto for four years? What we're doing is, or do I want to get a choice? And I can get an IDC information about whether I choose to stay in this area or not. Well, I would encourage you, uh, 
uh, sometime next summer, we will set it up at the construction office, and we'll be happy to go through uh, some more details of the, of the truck hauls and, and anything else you might be concerned about. Great. And then the other question I had is I looked at the 2006 environmental impact report that was adopted in 2011, and of course, by now it's hopelessly out of date, but just a minor, which is having a way of gentrification. And I'm wondering what sort of amendments are there. Is that 2006 report still legal to make decisions upon? Or, is, or are you actually updating it to reflect the reality? It uh, is still legal to make decisions on the form. Uh, to the extent that anything in the project is different, as we're developing the project, if things change, we'll, we'll consider what we have, if we have to reevaluate anything and we can validate the findings of the IR. But it is done. Uh, Okay, because like where I live, when I was living in 2006, the factory place is listed as industrial, and it's not. So I think that's the correct. There's no lucky jewels, there's no. The art system is in such a way of gentrification, and the traffic impact concerns me as well regarding quality of life. You have uh, one set of eight coming in with almost 500 units, you have another uh, apartment complex plan, you have industrial conversions to lots. The population is booming on my side of the river. And I'm concerned because Alameda right now in the last 90 days has become choked in the evening. It can take 20 minutes to get from 6th Street up to the 101 freeway. So the mitigation of traffic here is a very big quality of life. It is certainly on the, in the art system side. And I'm going to be very attentive to this and will continue to do so. So I appreciate your input. That's a good point. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. We'll consider that as we move forward. He's right about the recent bottle lines on uh, the bottle lines and the pay up in the art system. My name is Blue. Um, I'm a, 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 a downtown LA Motor Council board, and I'm also in the chair of the uh, uh, new Joint Group of Oversight Committee, which is a balance between uh, downtown LA Motor Council and Royal Heights Neighborhood Councils. And uh, I only have two questions. One was just simple. I didn't quite understand your description. You said there's two models when they uh, uh, proposal is being picked up. One is where they draw the plans and they find contractors who specific buying and the other is where they somehow have the contractors, but it was not really clear uh, exactly which one this was from your description. It was the second that I described where we're hiring the contractor now to participate during the design during the design. Thank you. Uh, and then the other uh, question um, had to do with the uh, arts budget. Was that a, a committee that got put together that there's I think it would be best to probably discuss that your situation. 
session uh, one on one to find out exactly what your, your situation is and we can talk about it further. So after the meeting, I think you're just going to talk to me and we have some people from our real estate team that can help address some of those questions or at least help provide you some of the answers and start a dialogue with them. Yeah. <clears throat> Another question I noticed at the beginning, I looked at the PDF on your website, whatever the website with the long PDF. You can see our building the first couple of photos, but as it goes further down, further down, you see gardens and a place for it. So what, where, what's, I don't understand this. Why do you see the place of the building? I mean, it's like gardens, trees. Okay, well, I, I have to just, it, but well, that one is building you're talking about. It's, it's got a big black X on it. I'm sure you guys have seen it. <laughs> we, that building is there in the beginning of the PDF. As you can scroll down, it's become gardens. Okay. So are there other different phases of construction, like the, the, the demo of the build and then gardening? Honest question because what would be an end of the main later versus now? These are questions that just we can't get answers at all. Well, to, to simply ask that question, we're working on acquiring all of the right away that we need for the project uh, now. At one time, it's not going to be on the basis. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we're, we're going to have this land. When we acquire that property, there's going to be land underneath the body, but obviously, that's crossing over that we want to landscape and do something with. But we're working on developing those plans, but we'll discuss that more clearly uh, in the future meetings. Um, and with regards to your specific property, if, I would say this: if you, are, if you aren't aware that your building is going to be uh, acquired, the property is going to be acquired, then it probably is, because I think we've been in contact with all of the property owners at this point. So but we can talk to you about exactly where you're at and, and how it relates to the project. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay.
institution is not just for this project, but it happens in all projects. And some costs are a little louder because if those are fund resources, you can't um, use them in the population. So it's, that's um, a cost of doing business, and we think that we arrived at um, a fair number, but we too will be watching the cost of the runs because if the cost increases, then the percent for our application also increases. So. My name is Teresa Marcus, and I'm one of the original advisory community for the Sixth Street Bridge, which uh, we went to meetings for about four years, and at the end, we were thrown through the, through the LA River, and we were gone, because we didn't agree, and we had too many questions, and we were totally ignored, even now we're ignored, not even created a new advisory board, okay? Well, keep on doing that because every advisory board is going to have questions at the end. But I want clarification. The four, $401 million, what does that include? Is the, original, the, the complete bridge or just the part of the bridge? I know it doesn't include landscape underneath or anything like that. Okay, I also know that it doesn't include how much the city is going to pay for the land that you're going to take over and the, and the buildings that are going to be destroyed. So why don't, you, why don't you give us a very good scenario and summary as to what you see the real cost right now Building the bridge, not cutting anything down, not cutting any of the designs or anything, but the way you're showing us the bridge with the light and everything else, and a, and a bridge that will, will stand a 7.1 earthquake. That one looks like they already hit an earthquake. But I want to know exactly the cost. I want clarification now as to those items and the cost. So the project budget is four hundred and one million dollars. It does include all the right of way costs of acquisition of all the properties that you mentioned, the demolition of those properties, and includes construction of the viaduct. As I mentioned earlier, this is a, a viaduct um, replacement project, and there is limited funding for landscaping. It's not it's not a, a lot of money, but it is not a landscaping project. But we will landscape the area and the viaduct. So all that is included in four hundred one. But it's not included the design that you first showed us, the landscape that was there. You need to be more transparent as to what you're talking about, landscape. Anybody can say landscape, cleaning it up is a landscape, okay? So I, I want clear, constructive information and faction that, we, that I can hold on to. No gray areas, please. I can't, I have a trouble, I have trouble with gray areas, okay? So you know I don't get along with politicians. As I mentioned earlier, um, the landscaping plans are in development and we intend to present that to the community uh, next year when we have them developed. So there will be clarity as we go to those presentations in the future. But it's not included in the 401. It is included. What part of it? I mean, how much is it going to cost you to build the bridge? How much is it going to cost you to do the landscape? And of course, the land is, is not free, so we don't know how much that's going to cost us, right? Yeah, these are all very good questions. What we can do is, in the next public uh, community briefing, we'll prepare information that gives you a breakdown of all the funds and hopefully it clearly okay. illustrates to you where that money is going. Okay. And if you have any more questions, the, the last question is, did I hear right that you that they going to change the name of the bridge? I don't think anybody said that here, but I, if I understood correctly, the, the Public Art Advisory Committee uh, put forth an idea that there's potential to consider uh, naming the bridge as part of Okay, the please don't give it to Weezer. He'll name it some singer from Mexico. <laughs> and we don't want that, okay? We're in the United States. We gotta look to the future in in America. <laughs> no. I want something worthwhile. My name is not important. But
But we get to keep an eye on this. We're going to come to the meetings, and we want to hear the truth and the exact amount that you have. And we don't want any changes. And no Mexican names, Mexican singers that nobody knows. Thank you. Yes. 
that were uh, evaluated or identified during the viral impact report stage uh, generated the funding that we identified for all of the right of impacts. So all those businesses that are being impacted, the properties that are being impacted, uh, were budgeted for. I'm not sure which exact businesses um, the gentleman was referring to, but certainly if there are any concerns, they can contact us and we can have a discussion about this.
take an adjacent to the bridge and possibly make underground parking, is that something that's been thought about? Are there any other parking measures on the on our side, on the west side of the bridge? Um, yeah, that, that's something we have to consider during this development plan that we're going through this land that we provided to see if there is any opportunity to include additional parking for, um, I guess you said you're protecting all the alum visitors or sightseers as opposed to the, the bridge that we see. Well, we've increased the population in the arts district by double in the last, you know, what we will be um, in the next few you know, years. So we're going to be on these new developments that are going to be coming out of the area. Talk about 
was a river gateway expanding itself, making it a little bit, making it more inviting, wider, nicer area that could be used for recreational purposes. So that would be part of getting access to the river area, is through that, that river gateway. So that's, I think that answers your question. Well, that's, uh, excuse me, that's and I just sort of see this like most parks where they don't do natural trails and people can make their own trails or pushes into the dirt. And if we know people are going to walk from one side to the other, they want to go down instead of up. Is that plan and design? Excuse uh, me. At this time, as I was mentioning, uh, the access to the river is going to be uh, basically from the west side through the uh, gateway that we call it, what uh, we used to call it, uh, and but in terms of getting to the other side of uh, the river and to the park area, you'll have to actually go along the top, you know, the bridge there. Then you can either access it through a pedestrian bike ramp that will be attached to the bridge, go down to the bottom, or through the uh, stairs that will be uh, uh, located off the bridge, take it down the bottom as well. And from the piggyback cars all the way to Vernon, it's all concrete and base, there's no open base. In terms of the river? Yeah. Uh, uh, so at this point in time, yeah, we're not in touch on the configuration of the river in terms of the concrete line. Yeah. Okay. Are, there, are there any parts where it's sort of stair step, concrete? Yeah. We're, we're proposing a terrace along the west bank, you know, something we still need to uh, take the ground for engineers. I get their approval on, but uh, that's uh, part of the concept. Um, on the west side, but not on the east side. Not on the east side. People walk back and we still track on one side. You have to go to the other side. What is the extent of your involvement with our program engineers in this type of connection with something that you've missed in the group project? I'm sorry, sir. You, uh, yes, what, what, what talk, have you had any talks with your program engineers and what is the connection?
really, I'm willing to be a most um, on the principle of your plan is incorporated and architect. Um, I attended your uh, first presentations uh, that were held over at the Tech Center and at the facility uh, uh, of oil. And uh, the question that I have is, from those presentations that were made there, which were conceptual designs, uh, how has this updated design that you show us today uh, changed or differed? Shows that historically, as uh, Camino Real, 
And so maybe we need to take a step back and see if some of that history could be put into the, the design. Thank you. Mom and pop shops that are up there are we going to be also included in uh, the 
part of this bridge. I mean, we're right at the front of it. You know, we're at the top, and exactly what you were saying. You know, we had our business that did it for years, and we're actually uh, born and raised to go hike, so we, we want to just, uh, you know, be part of this also. So I wanted to ask you if, if, if there's going to be more outreach going up there towards the top of the, of the hill. Because I know like, the last time we said that he was going to work on an AD pass the freeway. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, in terms of uh, outreach, I, I, I'm not sure we're going to, but we are uh, doing the intersection improvements there, Whittier and Boyle, and some of the other intersections uh, north and south of that. Um, I'm not sure, quite sure I understand what it is you're asking in terms of the outreach. So the oh, well, the zone has to really, like, they came and talked to us a year, like a year ago, maybe a year and a half. And so I know it's moving forward and stuff, so, I mean, where are we in the plan right now? You guys did have plans for the top of the hill, but you guys didn't have anything conceptual or drawn out or anything. So now that's been a year and a half, uh, have you guys come up with anything for the top of the hill? For the top of the hill, where the, where the, where the bridge, bridge starts. starts? Where the bridge starts? Not where it ends, it starts. Where it starts. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry to say, we're starting to go heights. It's where you got the best view. And we can go to downtown. That's the bottom. <laughs> Yeah, it looks great too. Yeah, and you've seen me show that image of the view looking towards downtown for Boyle Heights. Um, so you're talking about the area where the freeway is. Uh, that's the, the, the freeway. That's the freeway in that. That, that intersection with Domino's at, Domino's Pizza, the skate shop. I have, I have a, a open gallery studio so we can shoot art shows and uh, this uh, art space. Yeah. Well. That's right, we're in Boyle. Well. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, it extends for a soul. So, I mean, I'm just wondering. How much of the business, local business, will be a part of the? Because I think there's a lot of people in the room, but I think that most of the people in Boyle Heights are not here. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, well, as you said, our, our bridge project starts at the in between the five and the one on one freeway. So you guys go nothing towards the towards Soto. We'll be towards Soto, past Boyle, uh, east of Boyle. No, that was no. We have the project. It's a bridge replacement project, and the bridge doesn't extend that. Well, then we'll be able to still, I mean, I mean, I know it's going to be some kind of work going to be happening to enhance the top of the bridge, so is there any plan for creating anything out there with committees, with, I mean, we just want to be included, that's all. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, But uh, I don't know, maybe we can talk a little bit more for, for further afterwards, separately to understand what there is to talk about and try to answer your question. Okay, well, we're well, on Whittier. Well, right at the top of the bridge. Right, one of the one of Whittier. So we're going to be doing some intersection improvements then. The beginning of the bridge. Thank you. In regards to that, my name is Teresa Marcus. Born and raised in Boyle Heights, third generation, and that bridge means a lot to me. Uh, one of the issues was that we pushed as the advisory was why was the mitigation only 200 feet from the end of the bridge onto Weir? And if I remember right, and I wrote it down, that the commission said that they needed to extend that further out be, to mitigate the traffic. So what happened to that? So the mitigation, as you saw in the map that was put up earlier, is certainly more than 200 feet from the viaduct. It's a number of intersections, 20 intersections around the viaduct along 4th Street, 7th Street. Um, no, I'm not talking about any place else but we here. And Boyle and Boyle Avenue. Yes. We're, we're it was only included. They only included 200 feet at the beginning, and they said that was not viable. That you had to expand that because of the traffic coming across the bridge. It's going to be coming faster, and there's going to be more traffic than what we have right now in going into Whittier Boulevard. And I believe I have listened to several speakers that they're concerned about that. 
And I haven't heard anything from this group as to what is the intent, what is the plan. And I know it's not part of the bridge, but the commission said that they have to go beyond the 200 feet. And there's a, a, a three-way, if you notice, there's three streets coming into that intersection. And I think that has to be looked at and re-engineered. Thank you. So we're, we're past our main time, but we will take a couple more questions from the people that are standing and we'll try to wrap them. A couple of historic caveats. One of the things, Los Angeles was developed to be something other than Chicago and New York. We had ordinances that prevented anybody from putting any chairs or tables or anything on our beautiful wide city sidewalks. When I was a child, Los Angeles, the downtown emptied out and it was an absolute sterile waste by nothing there. And unfortunately, that's what I see happening under the bridge. What I'm seeing in the drawings here, I want to make sure that that is a part of that guys like the coffee roaster and the art galleries and things, but the things that you're going to put replace in the footprint of your bridge down there are actually on a human scale. That they actually draw people in. And if you can even wheel the Army Corps of Engineers to create a water feature in the, in the bridge, in the, in the river there, so it's actually like a river instead of an empty freeway during the summer months. And um, it would also be a good one. So, and, and I would also encourage those of us, who, uh, those of you who are working on the bridge, is that you may do something to connect the communities and to pull the east side out and into, the, into that area there. Because a lot of construction in Los Angeles just wipes something out and waits for two decades for, some, for the humans to come back in. And what fills those spaces in the meantime is trouble. Thank you for your comments. And I think this goes by that this design does do some of the things that are inspired to do. The last uh, question.